Morgan, thanks for joining us today. That was a wave. Was it? <laughs> okay, thanks. I guess. There we go. I got it. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for the Kelseyville Lake Pack virtual meeting today. Um, on our agenda is to go over the second community survey to see if there's any additional input that the LAPAC has to offer. If not, we are going to take this as strong community input um, that has a nod of approval of the LAPAC and it'll move on to the core team to be used as we draft the uh, um, local area plan updates over the winter. Um, just some introductions. Why don't I start? I'm Maria Turner, Director of Community Development. Uh, Ruby, go ahead. We'll do county folk and then move on to LAPAC members. Uh, Ruby Nitz, Office Assistant. And Morgan isn't technically a county folk, but go ahead, Morgan. If you can unmute. <laughs> Very My good. apologies. I haven't used Microsoft Teams in a while. Hi, I'm Morgan Alberti. I am a member of a, the Lake County AmeriCorps CERC team, and I'll be here to take some notes for you guys today for you guys to go over after the meeting. Excellent. Uh, Lucinda, you want to go next? And if you're new to Teams, you should be able to see the taskbar on the top instead of like Zoom where it's on the bottom. Um, you'll see the mic, if yours has a line through it, go ahead and click on that one to unmute yourself. And opening chat. See, we got a chat message here. Oh, just Morgan. Okay. All right, we're going to pass on Lucinda. Oop. Go ahead, Sabrina. Hi, folks. Sabrina Andrus. Uh... I am in the car currently, which is why my video isn't on, but I'll, as soon as I arrive in Oakland, I'll hop on video. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Mark Lips, and I don't see where I am. I'm not sure how to bring that up, but uh, Mark Lips with the Right Choice Farm Stay and Catering. We are in the Kelseyville region, but have a Lakeport address, which is interesting. So. Mm -hmm. Other Mark, go ahead. Uh, Mark Morgasani, Kelseyville resident, long time. Margo? Hello, this is Margo Kambara, long time uh, resident of the area. And I also have a Lakeport address, which is odd. I'm also the representative for District 4 on the uh, General Plan Advisory Committee. Thanks. Thanks. Weston? Uh, Weston Seifert, I have the Sasha Public House in Kelseyville, um, and I also sit on the uh, General Plan Advisory Committee as well. Super. Thanks, Weston. Nice haircut. <laughs> All right. So if you do not have your second survey pulled up, you can find it at lakecounty2050.org. We're going to go through it. Do you mind it. popping that link in chat? Oh, sure. Yeah. Me do that. Thank you. Go ahead and click on that. And then if you click on the documents tab, uh, just scroll down. You'll find second survey reports uh, for Kelseyville area. So let's jump in. One of the things I really thought was cool about uh, the Kelseyville survey results is that it was it was robust. I think it w was probably the highest number of um, results that we had in all of our planning areas. Looks like about 123. And not only that, but it was also more spread out across age demographics. Uh, most of our surveys were done by people either 50 and above. And in um, Kelseyville, we got 34 people between 35 and 50. So that's awesome. Consistent with uh, question three with across all of their surveys, mostly white people take surveys. 
So what that tells us as staff is that we have to continue our outreach to increase the diversification of getting the message out and getting input from different groups or entities or communities around the county. So we're continuing to do so. We did hold one uh, meeting that was just held in Spanish. Uh, I think it was last week, and that was great. So we do intend to... Um, going forward, make sure that our email blasts are also translated into Spanish. And then after the draft lake, uh, sorry, the draft local area plans come out, we'll have like highlights and summaries uh, done up in English and Spanish so that we can continue outreaching to both language groups. Um, we're going to skip part two, the local area plan boundary, community ground boundary, and land use map changes, because we're going to do that topic in person. Um, there, we're, Ruby's working on scheduling an in-person meeting just for the Kelseyville LAPAC so that we can talk about those three topics specifically. So that's questions four and five. Where 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 are you at? I can't I can't find the survey. The survey. I'm on the, I'm on the 2050. Is that under documents or? Yes, it should be under documents. Uh, let, let, me, let me share. Yeah, the doc that's in the chat. But let me go ahead and share um, the screen so that we can all look at the same stuff. Uh, take you down. Take you down. Where are you? Okay, let me get to it. LakeCounty2050.org, the house for everything, Lake County 2050 documents. Yes. Um, oh, you're right. I missed that part. Community engagement documents. Pass the land use maps down to survey number two results. Kelseyville. All right. Now everybody's going to see what I was looking at. Uh, I got you. Okay. All right. Good. Yep. Do you guys want me to keep this on a share screen or... Are we fine? Do y'all have your own copies for reference? Anybody? I'm good either way now. I like it shared. You like it shared? Okay. Then we'll just keep it up. So we're skipping part two. This is where we're changing the boundaries of um, of the whole planning area. And in Kelseyville, there are a couple different options. Um, Community growth boundaries, that's much smaller in scope, so you can't really see it on this map. And then any land use map changes. We're holding a an in-person meeting. Ruby, do you have a tentative in-person meeting for Kelseyville? Ruby's been working on finalizing that schedule. I thought I saw that date come through on calendar in my... Did you? Because I don't think we have a location yet. Anyway, yeah, no, on, I have um, right now it tentatively. It's uh, Friday the 8th from 1 to 2.30. Okay. Um, of, of the LAPAC members who are here, if it's possible, is it possible with any of you to, to hold uh, an evening meeting for our in-person meeting? Daniel. Is there a day that that would be okay for our members who have shown up today? Oh, hey, Brian. Welcome. Just, uh, depend I mean, it depends on the evening, but for me, it's fine. Weston, what about you? I know that you're usually at Saw Shop in the evenings. Is there a day where an evening meeting might work for you? Mondays or Tuesdays, about well, first part of the week, Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. Uh, okay. <clears throat> some flexibility. And Mark, what about you? Because I, I didn't get to, to use your responses on the last doodle poll, but so is there an evening at all during the week that's okay for you? Like Monday, Tuesday? Are we looking in November right now or? We are looking anywhere from. Not next Wednesday, because I'm in the rib that day. Uh, Thursday's Halloween. So either Friday, November 1st. Yeah, so anytime in November. 
Um, so I could, you know, meet Weston's needs there, like the fourth, or I could do the fourth or the eleventh or the twelfth. This is the next Monday or Tuesday. Okay, Mark, Brian, Sabrina, can you do the fourth? I'm checking right now on fourth, eleventh, twelfth. What was the proposed date again? Fourth or fifth. So fourth, Monday the fourth from maybe 5.30 to 7. Margo? Fourth works and, for me. Okay. I, Not the I, fifth day, the election day. I'm committed on the fourth to another meeting. Oh, you are? Okay. Yeah. But we have I'm the, not available uh, till 6 p.m. Holiday mixer on, on both on those fourth. days. Okay, let's go to that next week. The 11th? 11th is Veterans Day. I don't know if you guys are available. Um, I could I could probably try to hash out a time. I, every Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, uh, I work from 5 in the morning till 6 at night. What? Wow. I could okay. probably carve out a couple hours there. At the Just end. come after, Brian. What are you complaining yeah. for? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do that work schedule. That's rough. Okay, so <laughs> then what about um, Tuesday the 12th? We don't have a board meeting that day. Um, so we could start at 530 or 6. Sorry, Brian. Yeah, if you, just if, you, if we could start it a little later, that'd be great. Tuesday the 12th? Both Marks, Margo? Works for me. That's fine with me. Mark B. It's good. Yeah, that's fine. Six o'clock start? Is that what we're doing? Um, it would be a five o'clock start. It would be an evening meeting with the purpose of trying to get the maximum number of people who are working during the day to be able to participate. Oh, Brian can't be there till later in the evening, so. I it could be 5.30 or 6, too. We yeah, could start at 6. Six, good. I six, see a nod. Six works for me. I could, I could make it there by five thirty or six. Yeah. Okay, six, Sabrina. Yep, works for me. Good, Lucinda and uh, Margo. Six is good for me, Margo. Excellent. Okay, um, Ruby, can you go ahead and confirm that six p.m. to about seven thirty or whenever we're done? Don't don't put an ending time. Um, and we'll reach out to, who do we need to talk to about using the senior center? I forget. Or could we, Weston, could we do saw shop in the back? Unless you have parties. Yeah, I think, I think it's open right now. If you guys want to. Okay. Go. Saw shop. That's nice. I will. I will wait until the end of that meeting, get a drink. What a bonus. Okay, awesome. Oh, so Tuesday the 12th, huh? We have to wait to the end of the meeting? I do. Y'all can just do whatever you want. Though, mm. <laughs> we haven't really, I, I'm just not even going to go there. Yeah, you guys do what you want. So Tuesday the 12th, 6 o'clock, saw shop. Awesome, awesome sauce. Thank you. Okay, I'm glad we got that set up. And that is the meeting again, then, that we're going to talk about uh, community growth boundaries. So I just lost the website. Oh, good. Hi, Elizabeth. Thanks for joining. We're going to skip part two. And before we dive in, I just wanted to tell you that your input is really what counts here. So don't let me control this meeting. Make sure that that if you have something to say, you're saying it. Part three, and also don't let me rush you. Part three, other land use changes. Um, questions number six and seven came about from, st from staff. And it's because we've gotten a number of inquiries in the past about, uh, I'm gonna stop sharing because I can't see anybody. Um, we've gotten a number of inquiries in the past regarding um, diversification of uses on agriculturally zoned land, as well as 
Um, the other question about mixed use for housing is due to our efforts, our ongoing efforts to meet what's called the RENA numbers, which are the Regional Housing Needs Assessment numbers. Those are going to come out where we're guessing next year and in preparation for our housing element where we have to show excuse me, the state that we have enough land zoned compatible for residential development to meet the number of dwelling units that they say we have to accommodate during the six year um, housing element cycle period. So, so the first question was, um, how does the community feel about mixed use, which is the integration or co-location of residential as well as commercial uses in commercially zoned properties? So this would be picturing um, uh, like having an apartment over a pizza place or next to or like behind a coffee shop or something like that. Ruby, I'm going to put you on handling chat if you can. I see some chats coming up. Let me know if there's something we need to talk about. Um, and so across the board in all planning areas, the surveys came back with a very strong support for mixed use development, which is excellent because it's one of the easiest ways using that infill option. Um, it's one of the easiest ways that we can increase significantly our accommodation for housing numbers um, and meet that RENA number with it. And so it takes some of the pressure off of identifying locations for like additional high density housing and things like that. Does the LAPAC have any input regarding uh, mixed use options? This would be like in, in my head, it's the sort of retail on the bottom, you know, uh, living above it. Is that, are there other types that I'm not thinking of? That's kind of where my thought is as well, but we do have some um, places, even in Kelseyville on uh, Main Street that have like a small residence behind a store. Okay. So, but it would be a residence okay. on the same property. And then is this follow-up question, and then I'll shut up. Um, the type of retail, is that something that would be discussed in this particular portion? Or, right, I'm thinking I don't want like a dollar general on the bottom with condos up top kind of thing. Oh, good question. So, the way I'm seeing it would be, it would work out towards our C1 and our C2, or our community commercial and our local commercials. So those are our main streets. It could actually be near a Dollar General, though I doubt that would happen, but uh, only because Dollar General isn't into that kind of thing. And they're all owned, you know, yeah, either franchises like, or by know, corporate. Chain. But, mm -hmm. I was just thinking it, chain rather than prioritizing, you know, local, et cetera. It could allow for chains where there are chains because they go into our C2 uh, or community commercial land use designation. So it is possible, though unlikely. More likely that it would be residential units near um, our, our mom and pop shops or on top okay. of our mom and pop shops. I, I okay. have always been a uh, communities where you can bring a vibrancy uh to a community or to a like a main street not i'm not talking about out where you would find a jo dollar general or tra or a uh, you know a, one of the big stores but um uh, i just think having apartments or condos above these stores would create a you know almost like a, a, a lot of walkability a lot of uh um just a vibrancy to the neighborhood um the other the other thing we did in another town I lived in is we only allowed uh, retail on the first floor. In other words, if you were a real estate company or a, uh, you know any non retail, you had to go to the second. Um, that was just a, a oh interesting something we did there, and and then just to give you an example, there's a Costco in L.A. that has developed the whole second floor of that huge Costco footprint into uh, really nice apartments. Eat. And they're doing it more and more all over. When, uh, when we say retail, does that include, are, like, are restaurants considered retail, or is that retail retail? No, restaurants would definitely be retail. Yeah, we would, it would be residential with commercial. So local commercial, community commercial. So that could include restaurants. 
as well as like engineer's offices or doctor's offices or you know anything anything you could picture going down Main Street Kelseyville probably yeah now is is this only in relation to Main Street though because if we're in my head I was thinking um, you know like along Canocti or something with the schools if that's a growth bound and then we've got some commercial that goes in there can we be prescriptive about general types of, of um, commercial or, or uh, this would or be housing, housing allowed within local and community commercial uh, land use designation areas. Not so much where you start getting into more of the manufacturing or the service commercials, because that okay. becomes problematic um, when you're putting housing out in places that have excessive odors or excessive noise right. or things like that. Yeah. yeah. So we'd avoid those areas. And can you, since I'm in the car and don't want to be like zooming in on stuff, to uh, Canocti Road, what's that? Um, what's that zone that's? I'm sorry. I'm uh, guessing it, part of it is R1 back where all the subdivisions are, but I think as you go towards Kelseyville, it's gonna you're gonna get rural residential and rural lands towards there. And so okay. you would not be you would not see a lot of your local commercial. Um, you would see more primary ag uses out there. Okay. Anybody else? If not, we're going to move on to ag. Diversification. Okay, so in the last few years, we've gotten a number of inquiries, particularly from wineries, looking for additional ways they could use their agricultural products, their grapes, to create other products. Um, the state ABC just changed their rules so that they'll now allow microbreweries to be located in the same um, area as a winery. And so our zoning ordinance and our general plan don't address that because it's not something that were, was thought about when those were developed. Additionally, um, distilleries are, are now becoming inquiries to locate that so that um, wine grape alcohol could be distilled to be used as, you know, in other products as well. So that's why the question was placed on the survey. Um, and across the board, it's also gotten uh, very strong support. But what's really interesting is the next question was, well, if you do support ag diversification, what kind of uses you know, are you into? And across the board, all planning areas they said, you know, yeah, brewery, microbrewery is fine, distillery is fine. But what we really are digging is youth agriculture and wilderness education, which was cool and surprising, um, especially, but, but very timely since there are a number of organizations already stepping up to fill that need. Like uh, Terra is, is looking at different parcels where they can perform eco restoration with the goal of teaching uh, people how to restore their own properties. And um, and the youth agriculture that's been brought up as an example in other um, lay packs that are taking place in the schools. So what I'd love to hear what the lay pack has to say about diversification of agricultural uses to expand the types of um, uses and products that could be done on ag parcels. And if you have any other input regarding youth ag or wilderness education or if there's anything else that wasn't on that survey that you think would be appropriate. Well, having just gone through the 10 acre issue, um, as you know, um, how, are, how are small businesses like this, if they have smaller parcels, going to be able to be ag? If they're under 10 acres, they're not classified as ag. So yeah, um, a lot of them, I'm sure, you know, smaller parcels, you know, um, things like that. So will they run under commercial or would they run under ag exempt? You know, it makes a big difference when you're trying to build a building or um, for speed and complexity and cost. Um, building under an ag exemption is a lot different than developing under commercial. Uh -huh. That is a very good point because later on in the survey, we're also seeing results that encourage community gardening or urban farming or a lot of other types of ag that can be done in small spaces that can be used commercially. So, uh, Morgan, what you're going to want to make sure you make note of for this one is, uh, what would the question be? It would be, how can 
ag parcels formerly thought of as primarily residential qualify for commercial agricultural benefits, something like that. Okay. Um, I'm just, gotcha. I'm still struggling a little bit with some terminology, but um, yep. yeah. Don't gotcha. worry. Just write down what you got. We can go over it after the meeting too. I'm assuming that's not something we have jurisdiction over. Um, thanks for raising that, Mark. I didn't know it was the 10 acres. That's not something we have any power to adjust or create language around collaborations with uh, if it's under 10 is it it's just black and white if you're under 10 nope and well, it can't under, be shared or under 10 it, it has to go to the director for a variance uh, okay and you can either get that or not um i was unsuccessful in my attempt um but okay. for whatever reasons uh i believe they can but you know if they have to go and ask every single time you know, right, I, I, right. I just know it's uh, there's a big difference, and most of these guys are running tight budgets. You know, their businesses aren't super successful because they're small, and the cost yeah. of the club is horrendous uh, to do yeah. anything. So, um, and this is a really good yeah. moment for um, to point out to the LAPAC why you guys are spending time going through this right now. Um, it's not so much of whether we have a jurisdiction over something. What we are doing is gathering input from which we're going to derive priorities that need to be covered, either in the local area plans um, or in the, in case of this particular question, agricultural uses for smaller properties that could get put into as a priority in the agricultural element, which is a countywide um, element. And so it's a really good question. I'm glad that, that Mark brought that one up. Anybody yeah, else? Me too. I have a suggestion on the ag supportive uses. Um, Lake County is going through a big push to promote blues, blue zone priorities. I think we should do everything we can to uh, support that effort in making healthy life choices. So that would, you know, be promoting um, a more walkable community and a community that makes healthy choices in terms of, you know, curbing um, alcohol consumption and, and consumption of other substances. Also, for any ag supportive uh, use, um, it should be a requirement that uh, that establishment follow fire safety re requirements for the roads that means being 4290 and 4291 compliant thanks thanks margo anybody else all right we're going to move on to the next one let's see would you like more industrial development for example, lumber yards, manufacturing facilities, warehouses in Kelseyville. 44 no's, 25 yeses. And then some of the stuff that they wrote in, um, uh, any undeveloped land adjacent to the highway, light manufacturing that's sustainable. Don't care where in Kelseyville necessarily, just want the opportunity for Kelseyville to grow. Um, for local uh, good paying jobs, not lumber yards. Does that spark anything? Any input from LAPAC regarding manufacturing or industrial land use? Well, service commercial is in desperate need of supply. There is nowhere to go for anybody to open a 2,000 foot business, a 5,000 foot business. Again, though, it, it really falls to the difficulty in developing and the costs. You know, where guys, you know, if we're going to build a building, put it up for rent, you know, 5,000 square feet might cost somebody $6,000, $7,000 a month now, and little businesses can't make it. But, um, I mean, that's, you know, when you get into light manufacturing, you know, granite shops, cabinet shops, you know, service commercial businesses, uh, gutter yeah. shops, you know, plumbing houses. Um, all that kind of stuff is good, um, and there is, you know, definitely a need for it, for sure. Okay. Anybody else? 
I, I'm not I feel like I'd be in support of. Oh, go ahead, Weston. Are you talking? Oh, you can go, go finish up. I again the 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 jobs that some of these would bring. I think maybe on a case by case basis, if you had a you know an Amazon warehouse that wanted to land somewhere in Kelseyville, I I would have a hard time turning that away for the for the jobs. I mean, there's uh, one of the main complaints I hear about Lake County is there's not there's not jobs that would uh, that support um, people's lives. And um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little bit more leaning towards, uh, you know, taking uh, some space on a case by case basis that if, uh, you had somebody that wanted to develop something that was going to bring 50 six figure jobs or, you know, something to the area. I don't know why we would say no to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and on a smaller scale, this could be similar to the rezone. You know that your family did to take uh, to to allow for like an ag support business there. Um, yeah, so so we could. I want the. I, I would be great if the LAPAC would make note of this topic because this is pertinent to when we do meet in person and talk about changing land use designations. If there are any locations that the LAPAC feels might be appropriate so that should someone want to establish a light manufacturing um, business, they wouldn't have to go through a rezone and general plan amendment. The community would already have said, these are the places where we think would be appropriate for that sort of development in the future be it either it, it's definitely not going to be costco or amazon they're they're not knocking down our door it would be more something of like um kind of like the old window manufacturer you know down at uh work right that's now the the cosmetics manufacturing plant something similar to that it's much a smaller scale than at with much less impact than like the the box the the big amazon distribution centers but keep that in mind so that we can take a look at it and discuss it again when we're looking at the map. Do we have, is there a place, is there an area like a, a footprint that's designated an industrial zone? Something like that, like where Kelseyville Lumber is, uh, across the street and, you know, all that area right there feels pretty industrial. Is there a... Uh -huh. Yeah, I think Kel Kelseyville Lumber was rezoned to uh, plan development commercial, but there is that property over on the other side, right, Mark? Is that still plan development commercial as well? No, that's actually industrial uh, that goes oh, down okay. on the opposite side of Brian's property down to the county yard. Right, that's yeah, all, yeah, where Granite all, was. That's all industrial, and then I think okay. Brian's changed to an ag industrial, whatever that mm -hmm. was. I'm not Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's pretty much all industrial. The old Lang Brothers property, uh, your TNT storage is in there. But it's more of a parcel by parcel thing rather than a zone. Oh, uh, no, the base. Well, no, it pretty much. You know, once you cross uh, Merritt Road there, everything on down except for my little seven acre chunk of PDC there uh, it is all industrial. Well, it's kind of a zone, then, huh? Three, I think. Right. What happened to the uh, GIS site? The parcel map doesn't come up anymore. It comes up, but there's this really long delay um, that I need to talk to Lon about because it's trying to upload the latest flood map layer. So you just got to let it sit for a while because okay. then you'll get this window pop up that says we can't do the flood layer. And you say, OK, and then it's fine. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm not very patient. I'm not either. It took me three tries to figure that one out. <laughs> the I, I don't know if this is the right place for this, but like one of the things that um, I wanted to at least kind of put out there for planning um, and, and like where that sits, but the like does like if somebody put in a solar farm, like if Kelseyville had a solar farm that um, supported uh, local businesses. Um, during either peak day pricing or whatever that PG&E does. Like we know PG&E is not going to get any cheaper, um, but like where's, where's the space for that, that conversation to like, um, is that, is that zoning? And is that, is that something like with the amount of ag land that we have, like that somebody could use, you know, rent a part of their, um, property to be able to put in 
you know, a solar farm or wind farm or something like that to be able to offset, uh, uh, you know, PG&E? Good question. And I'm glad that you asked because we have started having internal conversations about changing the aggregate resources management plan or element, which is the plan that oversees extraction of resources from our creeks and our quarries and changing that into a sustainable energy uh, resources management plan, which would include solar, wind, hydroelectric, um, geothermal, Things like that. So that's still in the in the talk stage. Um, but let me take a look. You know what, Weston? I don't want to hold us back, but your question is pertinent and it should go somewhere. I'm not sure where. Right. Because right now we do allow for solar farms in a number of different zoning districts. Um, and depending on the amount of energy it's collecting, it could be looked at as a power generation facility. So we do have stuff for that already in there. But uh, Ruby, make note, let's take a look at that so I have a better answer when we have our next meeting. Or I can send an email out to the late pack. It's good stuff. Good job. Okay. Anything else on this one? If not, we're going to move on to part four, individual communities and neighborhoods. All right. Question number nine. Are there any communities or neighborhoods that are not well represented in the existing local area plan? 48 people said, no, we're good. 13 people said, yeah. And of those, the write-in answers were Riviera, which actually isn't even in this area plan. Um, Highland Springs neighborhood. Is there a Highland Springs neighborhood? I don't know. Okay, keep going. Um, all areas outside the town of Kelseyville are underrepresented. Donovan Valley, Bell Hill Road to Gold Dust, Native Communities. What kind of input does LAPAC have? Do you feel that there are portions of the Kelseyville planning area, communities in which um, that, that are not represented in our local area plan? Currently, the area plan boundaries, or they cover uh, the the areas of Big Valley, Kelseyville, and Finley. What does it get you if you are recognized as part of that? I mean, what do you what do you win? <laughs> Great question. What's the point of this question on the survey? Yeah. It keeps going. The point of this question is to start pulling out um, a community feeling of whether we need to create special study areas to focus on policy and design guidelines for any certain portion of the community. Yeah. Oh, well, and I you have... Yeah, uh, you know, the way that they're wanting to do housing now is, you know, more more houses per lot, more houses per acre, everything's getting denser and denser and they're trying to keep things close to the highways. Um, so, you know, you kind of get into the Kelseyville area, um, you know, out near Gold Dust, Bell Hill Road, you know, there's a lot of places out there. There's no infrastructure yet. I don't think sewer and water, I think they go to about the cemetery and I think that's about it, but um mm -hmm. i would say yeah i mean really you know there's not much focus when you get across the highway on kelsey bell so across the highway would be maybe a little un unrepresented um when you get off of main street it's always a tough thing because you don't you know especially with commercial if you start spots voting it's for example going over by highway patrol with you know a grocery store um should that be all service commercial out there um, or should it be heavy retail? Um, you know, and then you start stretching Main Street out and your Main Street ends up dying. Um, sort of got off topic there a little bit, but. Well, we do want to avoid sprawl. Right. So, I don't know. Um, I would say, you know, areas, yeah. I mean, you get out across the freeway, you know, there's just not much attention out there. And, um, you know, maybe eat out even into the Big Valley area. Got a lot of egg parcels out there that are just sitting, you know. Um, but yeah, I would say there's underserved areas. Okay. 
now. Yeah, I'd second, I'd second those areas Mark just mentioned. Yeah, on the subject of representation, um, Middletown is um, considering something similar. There are, uh, the area plan is called Middletown area plan. At the, uh, one of the map meetings for the all LAPACs, um, there is now being um, talk about renaming that area plan. So similarly, I think for clarity and consistency, it would be a positive mood, a move for um, our area plan to have the same name as our advisory council, Big Valley. Because that way, it, in, it's a big umbrella for the smaller communities that are in the current Kelseyville area plan. And it also covers a lot of the rural um, parcels that are outside um, the town of Kelseyville. Okay, thanks. Anybody else? All right. I mean, I wonder, I wonder if calling it Big Valley then sort of negates a lot of the hilly, we're talking the Riv, Buckingham, all of those things that aren't necessarily like in a valley. Um, I mean, I also think that, well, yeah, that's all I'll say. Well, the Rivieras, uh, including Buckingham, have their own area plan. So Kelseyville area okay. plan only includes Kelseyville uh, and um, it, so T Kelseyville proper, not everything that has Kelseyville in the mailing address as well as Big Valley and Finley. Yeah, duh, I knew that. My bad. I was there when we started the be back. Sorry. <laughs> All right, so the follow-up question was, are there any communities or neighborhoods that require localized policy guidance? So if if we feel that the rural areas, like the ag spots in Finley, or the more rural agricultural areas that you got over on Gold Dust or um, Bell Hill, do, do you think that those require additional localized policy guidance? Currently, they are ruled pretty much with the um, agricultural element, as well as the zoning district guidelines for ag APZ, which is ag preserve zone, uh, rural lands and rural residential. Which tends to dedicate most of its primary uses for agriculture. I have a, I have a, just an opinion on that. I wish there was a, a vessel to make it a little bit more flexible um, because I know once we things are set and their zoning uh, once their zoning is set it, it makes it really difficult to amend these things so like if somebody presented some amazing plan like say we didn't say it needed any special attention and someone presented some amazing plan on Bell Hill and mm -hmm. it actually makes a lot of sense right but they're stuck or they're pigeonholed because of the zoning I wish there was a vessel to 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 take that on a case by case basis and you go, you know, this is a great idea. It's actually really good for the community. It'd be good for this and this and this. And I see more pros than cons. We should do this. But if we're, if we're, if we're constricted by, you know, all the many things, the red tape and bureaucracy and, and uh, the confines of whatever zoning might be there. I wish, I wish there was a way to, um, I don't know, have some flex. Is there anything with that Maria? Let me tell you what we have, and you tell me if this is what you're talking about. So you could rezone to uh, plan development commercial or plan development residential, and that allows for more innovative, more creative um, overall development plans than you would normally get if you're just going with RL, RR, you know, and, and those regular, our, our normal zoning districts. So the PDC is how Crystal Lago got developed. Um, it's what Maha Gwenock Valley is doing. It's where people come in with this idea that doesn't quite fit into any of these zones. So they want to create like their own overall development plan. Does that sound kind of like what you're talking about? <clears throat> yeah, that, that that would be it. It's just uh, that's, that's not quite a process, huh? Well, um, it does include a rezone uh, because it, it creates a specific boundary uh, upon which that more creative uh, leeway is or is developed in a, in their overall plan. 
And I when understand that. Residential be... commercial versus what were the two residential? Plan development commercial plan development. and plan development residential. Residential. Yeah. So is that the difference between a plan development residential would be, you know, Airbnb, uh, farm stand sort of thing versus building a hotel? Is that the difference? It's the difference between Airbnb, building a hotel, farm stands versus Crystal Lago multi-use golf course facility. Hmm. Two different things. It would be because you can still you don't need a rezone and stuff to do a farm stand or um, or uh, Airbnb. You might need a, a minor use permit for an Airbnb de depending on what size it is. And we actually don't have Airbnbs right now. Um, we have what are called bed and breakfasts or bed and breakfast in. And but isn't the, our we haven't. Mm -hmm. Isn't our recourse for sorry? Isn't our recourse for if we want like what Brian was saying if. if if we want to do something on that property, isn't that what the planning commission is for? We go and pitch the planning commission and and at times. And they give us the the flexibility to do something if we put a good argument together. At or, times. There are a lot of allowed uses where you don't even have to ask planning. You maybe just need a building permit if necessary, but there is no planning permit required. But other uses, as, as they go up in the scale of anticipated impacts in the environment, um, then you go into, yeah, you need a minor use permit. And that goes to the zoning administrator, not the planning commission. So it's a little, it's less work or less attention i guess and then planning commission um for major use permits so yeah yeah kind well, of what i, what I would say is you know having gone through this process to what brian's uh touching on you know where i rezoned from uh you know i was in the area boundary but i went from a, a base zoning of ag to a base zoning of pdc pretty much wrote my own um kind of my own general plan for my property. So sat down and you basically write down all the things that you think you might do with it. And that sort of becomes your own controlling document for your piece of property um, when you get it zoned to PDC. And that's what I have the lumber yard on now. And then the property over by Brian's is all a uh, plan development commercial, you know, with an existing sort of general plan that goes along with it um, mm -hmm. when we developed it. And these, um, these, uh, I loved your question, Brian, and my, my question then to you, Mireya, is a potential rezoning. Is this going to be part of our in-person conversation when we're actually looking at the boundaries and then discussing zoning? Is we don't discuss zoning as a laypack because we're working on the general plan, but you, but, but similarly, the mirror part of that is we will be talking about land use designation amendments. And then okay, yeah, if we yeah. change those, then after the general plan's updated, that's when we're going to do the reason like the, the new rezone map too, because right, it so has to could, mirror what we decide we want in land okay. use designations. So we could kind of sow the seeds for an adjustment in zones. Exactly. What would be yeah. interesting, okay. Maria, is if you guys came up with like a PDA, plan development ag, we got plan development commercial, Ooh, plan development residential. That's an interesting idea. That's cool. Plan development ag, where I like that. some ag land could go and sort of write their own. Uh, I don't know, just just a thought. You know, yeah, I mean, it, we're idea. doing it residential and commercial, but um, that is a really know, interesting thought. Point, yeah, Morgan, make sure you write down PDA, plan development ag. We want to capture that definitely. I think that plays into the whole mixed use for wineries and uh, it totally could do that. Yep. Kind of stuff to, to attract. Yeah. Cool. Now I can put in this my is good stuff. You guys are cranking. All right. What else? <laughs> oh, I shut you up. I didn't mean to stop. This is good. Okay. Well, the plan development ag covers a lot of sins, so that's uh, that's a good one. That is a good one. A lot of answers. Okay, we're going to go on to policy options, but just to make sure I'm capturing this last one about areas needing special policy or 
design guidance regulations. I'm not really sensing that so much um, that we need to focus on a, a, a community within the planning boundary, uh, but more that we want additional options and flexibility in land use designations. Is that accurate or am I missing something? Yeah, I see a nod. Uh, that's about right. Okay. Okay, good. I just want to make sure that as we report back to the core team that we're we're really capturing what this lay pack is feeling. <sighs> okay. This one's fun. Part five, policy options. How should the county preserve small town character? So the answers, the the choices on the like multiple choice survey answers um, were pretty even across the board as far as maintaining our small low density neighborhoods. Um, oh, preserving our historic and cultural features that contribute to small town character and feel. That was the 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 most picked one. Um, establish and maintain vibrant, convenient and attractive community spaces, destinations and events that foster social interactions. This one was kind of like just blending in with most of the other answers in Kelseyville's, but typically was the high winner um, in a lot of the other surveys. Uh, as far as write-in responses, we got uh, addressing blight, environmental preservation. We need more parks in the Riviera area. Again, not, sorry, that's not this one. That's not y'all. Um, restrict cannabis odors, no more apartment complexes that the schools and fires can't support. Uh, protecting rural lands from unmitigated damage due to cannabis. Uh, prohibit big box stores. I'd be interested to hear your input on that one, uh, particularly. And also establish consistent fence setbacks in ag and rural residential zones to give space for pedestrians, uh, children, and equestrians. Anything else? How should the county preserve small town character? And what we're looking for here is um, a list of sort of priorities preferences, ideas that you think we should be striving for in the next probably 20 years um, to accomplish that will maintain and preserve the small town character of Kelseyville area. I've always had the opinion that uh, focusing on preserving our, your core Main Street is, uh, is a big part of maintaining a small town feel. Mm -hmm. um, that Preferably that would never change. And again, like Mark touched on earlier, we'd have to ensure that Main Street's not being stretched out, and there's a, a good plan um, to not interfere. I, I don't know what the right word would be to not mess up uh, the existing Main Street. I think everybody has a good feel that's from here and knows where Main Street is. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that starts to get stretched across the highway or or taken down uh, other streets uh, like Gaddy, I mean, I think there's I think there's plans in place. I think. Uh, the collective feel I get from people is there are some really good ideas out there on how to preserve it, but um, I just know focusing on our immediate main street seems to be uh, a good way to preserve that small town feel right now. Okay. To totally agree. I think, I mean, I think it could, the, the density, it really is kind of like the one block that gets that most play. I think that that charm could be extended a little bit. Um, and then I don't know if it belongs here, um, but definitely in thinking about the next 20 years, I think it would really behoove our community to um, keep that sort of small town charm is to actually make it pedestrian only for a block or two. There's some other towns who have done it. Grass Valley did it most recently. A lot of businesses hated it, um, but now they're sort of coming back around to it. Uh, it really just like ups the the activity and the walkability and the movement um, among a main street in a small town to make one or two blocks pedestrian only and put in really cool landscaping and market lights and et cetera. I'd love to see that. Interesting. Okay. What else? We, um, once again, at a former community, um, we limited the amount of square footage a business could, could have, um, to keep it a small town, small business atmosphere and kept, uh, so it could, we could put in a Starbucks. We weren't saying you couldn't do a franchise, but that French, but that Starbucks could only be sixteen hundred square feet or whatever the. I can't remember what we designated as 
And once again, like I said, it had to be retail on the first floor, uh, restaurants included. Um, no, uh, you know, no real estate, no um, banks, no things like that, except the ones that are already grandfathered. Okay. okay. Margo? I think, yeah, thanks, Maria. I think also trying to maintain that small town charm is to uh, consider limiting the acreage of ag. I know it, you have to have a minimum threshold to be profitable, but I don't think we want to have like ginormous ag um, because that can also send a different vibe into the town. And I don't know if that's what we want. Thanks. That is an interesting point because typically we are arguing to maintain as large a parcel in ag as possible. We do have a 40 acre minimum lot size for an ag parcel for the main reason that prime ag soils are finite in nature. And if we cut them down into ranchettes, which are the 10 acres and less, then we typically have historically have lost them for commercial agricultural production. Yeah, and that's but a good point. Interesting input. Anybody else? Um, I think going back to what was mentioned earlier about community gardens is a really good way to show that we are invested in the community and to be bringing community together and doing things for young families. Uh -huh. Good. Yeah, and community gardens are also going to come up again later, so hold that, hold that thought. All right, small town character. Are we done with small town character? We'll move on to roads. Okay, next one. What should the county do to improve, improve roadway safety for all users, including drivers, bicyclists, and pedestrians? So we're talking about uh, multimodal transportation safety. And in Kelseyville, like the rest of the surveys, the number one was um, prioritize roadway improvement and maintenance projects in the order of the following categories. One, urgent projects to protect health and safety. Two, safety projects intended to reduce the number of severity of accidents or number and severity of accidents. And then three, reconstruction and maintenance. Some of the write-in answers were um, fix and expand the existing roads we have, maintain Soda Bay Road better, Roundabouts are awesome. Um, see the answer above, standardized fence setbacks to allow for more um, safe walking, biking, and equestrians. Uh, traffic signage. Install a roundabout at Gaddy and Soda Bay. <laughs> um, colors, direction, signs for vehicles. What else? The only one I want to lift up of the other is um, something around Canocti and South Main or whatever that is as relates to school traffic. I think it's just going to get more and more intense and um, more and more unsafe, not just in terms of folks speeding, but like, you know, it, depending upon what time you could be waiting to turn left for like 45 minutes, not actually 45 minutes, but the traffic there, especially, you know, as our school gets more and more, our district gets more popular, like it's just going to be madness good yeah we are anticipating a, a significant influx of students as that housing comes online right i, right, yeah. I, I feel like i have a pretty good uh finger on the pulse of this topic as a parent and uh with my with my job i i i think it'd be prudent to gather some data-driven statistics on this uh the highway patrol and caltrans and everybody keeps incredible statistics on this and actually i don't think the crashes necessarily on uh main street in kelseyville are up um i think they're pushed out a little bit more towards other county roads like soda bay where speeds are a little higher um i think we've been really lucky uh that we haven't had anything major happen recently on main street because there are some we are starting to get some uh, we've had increased traffic and I, yeah, I'd like to second, uh, what Sabrina says is somebody who drops off their kids half the week when I'm, when I'm not working, 
it's it's chaos um it's, the the whole Canocti Road, uh, South Main Street, <laughs> highway access. You'd have to work with Caltrans to figure out how to develop turn pockets or you know whatever the whatever the engineers are going to come up with for for making access better. It's it's we're uh, we're ticking time bomb as far as gridlock at uh, peak hours around the schools. It's going to get worse. and then you get some really mad people, and then they make poor choices. So I guess the, co the the comment then is we just need we need a better traffic engineering, uh, traffic calming in that area. Go and figure. That sounds it. like a priority. Yeah. So. Good. I'm out of that area now. And the, the of kids. And I I think we've already said it, but the yeah, just the speed on Main Street. Um, you know, the, we've done some things to mitigate that a little bit, but, um, you know, being able to slow traffic down on main street would be, would be good. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the write-in comments said that raised, uh, crosswalks might be helpful with that. Those are yeah. those broader things than the speed bumps. What do y'all think about that? Yes. Bumps in the road are no good. Especially when you're hauling windows. Ooh. <laughs> good point. <Yeah>. Today. <laughs> yeah. You need to get on Soda Bay, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. No, okay, the next one. It's okay. always hard to get bumps past a, a, a county or a city council. I, I've tried that in other places, and it's... Uh, Good traffic calming, but boy, you'll you'll have the uh, pros and cons. Oh, One of the things on there on the list, Maria, was uh, you know requiring developers to um, put transit facilities or bus stops or do projects. The problem with that is the the Lake County Transit won't go on to private property. So when you have to build this bus stop or whatever you have to build, it has to go out on the main street. So you've got to build a turnout and you have to have a walking path that meets ADA that goes to that. Um, <laughs> it's a real, I mean, what they should do is just start pulling on the properties. I mean, it'd be easy to pull into the lumber yard and have a little bus shelter sitting on my sidewalk, but to go out onto the street and have to put these cause they don't want to go on private property. Uh, that's that's a real burden on developers and it shouldn't even be on the developer to do that. Um, so maybe you want a that priority. priority. Go ahead, Sabrina. No, I was just gonna say, Mark, do you would I don't I don't think you would want that liability though, right? On in terms of onto your private property, or maybe you just have banging insurance it and it doesn't matter. matter. You're liable for everything. You know, it, <laughs> okay. You know, it's parking lot is just public space. That, that's probably why they don't want to come on private property. They don't, you know, they don't want the liability of <laughs> Their rig, maybe I, I don't know what it is, but for that reason, it puts a heavy burden on somebody trying to. We ran into it when we did the hospice building up there, and um, you know we were going to have to build like a 300 foot walking path. You know, it had to meet ADA, so it was going to have to go back and forth, and it was just a mess. Um, hmm. And it's expensive, and you know um, it shouldn't be. You know, because most of these commercial facilities have somewhere on their developed site to put up a, a bus stand. But when you go out onto the roads and stuff, it's a whole different ballgame. So I didn't like that one at all. It, it seems like it might be, it seems like it, we do have a lot of s space. Um, it seems like it, that could be if county council came up with like a hold harmless thing for certain areas. And then there's the policy change for Lake Transit that they could stop at certain spots and or what do you think about happen. what do you think about a priority for a county to pursue grant funding to develop public rights of ways you know it, uh, as development increases for safe bus stops and walkways cuz this is about what can the county do over the next 20 years to come alongside 
and help out with this stuff? Um, I, I feel like I'll be with Mark on this one that whatever wouldn't put a burden on the progress because there won't be any progress if, if somebody has to spend, you know, several hundred thousand dollars more on a project that they're already shoestringing to, to uh -huh. incorporate a, a, you know, a, a a ADA compliant bus stop or a, you know, a bus stop that I'm not even sure. I don't want to get into the, the ridership data of Lake Transit. It's, it's needed. I understand it's needed, but um, I kind of feel like uh, I would just want to, whatever we could come up with that wouldn't hinder that development. Um, it sounds like a good plan to me. I agree for sure. I think it also is just a really good look in terms of PR and optics to have this be like, you know, very specific, you know, private public partnership um, in this particular area to hopefully be even more attractive to, to private folks coming. Mm -hmm. So one of the answers in the survey was prioritize improvements and expansions of bikeways and sidewalks to make active transportation more attractive, accessible, user-friendly, and safe. It would be something kind of like that, but it would be more along the lines of... Um, like either develop public private partnership policies, um, investigate funding opportunities or pursue funding opportunities um, to develop additional safe transit stops or something like that um, in accordance with development, with future development or complementary to future development, something like that. That kind of what I'm hearing. What you're saying? Love you just made that up. Fantastic. <laughs> Good. Like I want to make sure I'm picking up what you're putting down. You know, if, if something changed there, they could take that into existing businesses that currently exist. Um, okay. You know, if they come up with some plan to be able to um, say, hey, you know, KV Lumber, you know, we'd like to put a bus stop on your sidewalk and here's all the releases. And, you know, I know they okay. go into the college, um, I think. Mendocino mm -hmm. College, um, so they obviously um, must be able to do some things, but um, anyway. Yeah. yeah, okay. Last That's thing I say... Already. Last thing I'd say on this one is bike paths. Um, if we're particularly going to be talking more about, um, you know, more walkways and um, bike pathways than around the, like, creek and stuff i saw that in a couple places which i really like i don't do we have any bike lanes? i guess we have bike lanes on state street and some on main but i'm thinking you know some other places too i'm just going if we're dreaming big and we can just make it whatever we want in 20 years mm -hmm. well yeah and that was one of the the choices in the survey to consider all modes of travel including driving walking biking and riding transit in planning, design, and construction of all transportation projects to create safe, livable, and inviting environments for pedestrians, bicyclists, motorcyclists, and public. That one. Good. Well, it's quite a it's quite a quite a path they put down. Has anybody seen uh, in Middletown from Twin Pine North into their Main Street? Has anybody seen that development for that path lately? Yeah, that's crazy. It's like a county road. Oh, that that must have been an act of Congress because to to work with the state to to get in that easement and then kind of weave in and out of all the way up to their main street and tie it into to Twin Pine. Talk about a what a project! How yeah. long was that? That must have been in the works for years because I can't imagine the state uh, being very helpful on making that all happen trails. Quickly. All trails that are developed have been in the works for years. There are no quickies. But yeah, you know what? I was impressed with the little walkway um, on Pear Festival when I was walking back to Miley's old house, right alongside that new um, development there that, that cuts over from whatever road I was on over to, I don't know, whatever road that is, with the post office, Gaddy. There's that little walkway that goes right there. I don't, it impressed me. Yeah. I was happy. Little, oh, yeah. This little cut, no, that's cut through. Used, that's used a ton. Yeah, it saves yeah. a whole bunch of walking. And imagine if, like, it was cute. It was cute. It was a little creepy. There was some guy walking behind me, but overall, I thought it was pretty cool, and I, I emerged safely. Um, question number 14. How should the county improve the sustainability of the transportation network and support access to transit? So, 
Just like the other ones, the top answer was improved connectivity with other regional transportation services, linking Lake County communities to each other, to the region, and to major destinations such as the Sacramento Airport. Um, another big one was establish and promote public transportation programs that offer access to important destinations, for example, commercial areas, employment centers, educational resources, healthcare institutions, and entertainment. Some of the write-in stuff. The last thing you should do is require development projects to foot the bill for transit. <laughs> that sounds familiar. Um, need more bus service against, along Soda Bay through RIV. More EV stations. Um, oh, somebody's saying we don't need more transit because nobody's using it. Um, again, requiring developers to provide transit facilities is a joke. I think these people hear you guys. I think that you are uh, you're very consistent with the the survey takers. More services to disabled and seniors. Anybody have anything to say about regional connectivity and sustainability of transportation? We can skip that one. Next one. How should the county protect, preserve, and manage historic and cultural resources? <coughs> the top answer, which is pretty consistent in all the surveys, prioritize preservation and adaptive reuse. So repurposing something for a use different than it was originally developed for. Building sites and areas that have identifiable archaeological, cultural, or historic significance. Then what surprises me is the second priority or the second winner on a multiple choice survey was establish a process for considering the designation of structures older than 50 years as historic landmarks eligible for special recognition and preservation protections. That usually gets a reaction. What do you guys think? 50 years is not very old. It's not. But, well, keep going. I don't want to take over. Go ahead. Um, you, you just have to see what the benefits were for that. It's like Mark, the other Mark said, yep. you know, what are we going to win for doing that? Good. Yeah, that's what you I don't know. get. Okay, let me tell you. So when you have an historic preservation district or designated um, historic asset, it opens up the ability for the property owners to do maintenance or to get to secure grant funding to do maintenance on their properties to maintain that historic resource. That's the benefit. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. So when I was in Ukiah, I was working on this. And actually, I just got back from a Heritage Commission meeting today. And I think that in the future, they're going to be working on this. But in Ukiah, what we were working on was, one, trying to figure out where a building could possibly become historic. Um, and then secondly, establishing sort of um, guidelines and regulations to, to make sure that that maintenance would be done in accordance to... Hmm, Ah, it's like the internal, oh, Department of the Interior, Federal Department of the Interior standards for maintenance and renovation of historic structures. So there's a whole list of ways to go about um, making sure that these structures are maintained to to um, preserve the, the historic character and nature of the asset. When, when you do that, when you do that, is that is that designation in perpetuity I mean, forever? Um, in other words, some people have a problem with the whole historic um, registration in that they think it'll make it harder to sell their property if they ever get mm -hmm. to the point where they want to sell. I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> because they don't and, want responsibilities of, yeah. You know. And any policy that was developed for the designation of, of structures as historic assets could also be reversed. Ah. So, um, probably not easily. Sometimes, though, uh, it changes from owner to owner. You don't catch it. And um, and it's, there are renovations or updates done to that structure that change the character or make it no longer appropriate for, for preservation on, on an historic registry. And in, in those cases, it falls off or it comes off the registry. There are There should be 
ways for property owners to petition to have it removed if it's been added. Um, but but it's a process to get it on. It's a process to get it off. But the main win would be then that the property owner would have funds in order to maintain, renovate, update, uh, keep that structure relevant, but still preserving that historic nature, that historic value that is actually considered a community-wide benefit. Mm -hmm. Where does that funding come from, Mireya? Is that a federal? What is that? Do you know? Well, I'm uh, I'm thinking of federal. I think there are also state funds as well, um, but it's been a few years since I've really been chewing on that topic. So, um, I Mostly defer that one to our museum creator. Carolyn Borelli is actually okay. really good. She's a rock star in that field. Okay. Mostly I just wanted to make sure it wasn't county because because then if there's no money there, it's a bit of a moot point. County doesn't usually hand out money to fix a building. Though we are working on, but I diverge. So anyway, uh, back to the subject topic. Any input on preserving or managing historic and cultural resources? Nope. nope. All right. I'm going to go on to how should the county protect and manage its open spaces and preserve its natural beauty? Some answers were, um, or the top two were protect natural lands, including wildlife habitat, open space, agricultural lands, parks, and cultural historic resources from encroachment or destruction by incompatible development. And then the second winner was maintain and enhance views of scenic resources and significant natural features, including water and geologic features, ridgelines, wildlife habitat areas, and scenic roadways. Some of the interesting stuff that was written in, increase staffing and pay to take care of what we already have, limit the size, height, and location of greenhouses, quit tearing up rural lands for cannabis, something about sinking fuel tanks, uh, maintain groundwater and aquifers responsibly, Oh, here's a good one. Enforce code violations for blighted properties. That comes up actually in a number of different areas. Um, tree p preservation policy. What else? Is that sparking anything? Preserving our open spaces and natural beauty. Now, this was a key priority, a top priority all across the lake. Everywhere. All of our planning areas. This was one of the top three. It's always it's a tough one because you're you're butting up against development, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to make things look pretty, but then you want development too. And yeah, I mean, it's that's what that's what I was thinking. I'm going, you know, in other questions, we're talking about mixed use, PDA, uh, all of these things, and now we're talking about no, we need to keep it pristine, nature, uh, and for animals and all of that. It's it's we're yeah, we're running up. It's almost gets to the point where we really have to draw the lines and say, okay, this is an industrial area. Or, you know, you bring up a really good point because the the infill or the multi-use is typically in our commercial areas or our already developed areas. And so maybe a priority that might come out of this LAPAC is let's preserve our infill and our additional um, uh, commercial development within already existing areas rather than impacting our open spaces and our, our parks and stuff. And there's probably little areas of opportunity there where you could expand in that industrial, but uh, where you're not gonna really impact the overall look of the community. But geez, for someone who brings in guests and has a personal stake in, in raising the tourism here, it, you know, one of the things people loved, they love our farm-like appeal and the little farm towns and uh, we you got to keep that because that'll set us apart from all that sprawl that happens everywhere else. So uh, I think we need to put a fence around some of these areas that we're talking about, like industrial zone. Um, it's almost like the county comes up with its own little parks that are designated county parks. And I know that we have a county park, but I mean areas that can't be developed or, you know, public, public land. I mean, I, I don't know. I, uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that the, the people 
that are maintaining these scenic corridors and these beautiful places that everybody likes to see a beautiful lush vineyard and mm -hmm. uh, a beautiful fruitless maple tree as they're driving down Barrett road. Well, somebody planted that that owns the property right. and Maria, Maria Spurks product because I, I, my dad planted all the maple trees that go down the, the thorough, uh, the fruitless maples on the North side of Merritt, they go down in and there's, Pictures taken. Of Pictures taken. Time. It's a beautiful, it's beautiful road. Uh, it's a nice lead in uh, to our to our town, but um, nobody helps. There's no assistance. Right. Nobody's paying for the fuel for that tractor that runs through and mows that. Nobody's helping pay for the pruners. And I feel like when the farmers uh, eat it year in and year out, uh, so to speak, because farming is getting uh, less and less fun uh, from from by all accounts that I can hear um, financially. So uh, is there any assistance that can be given to these people that maintain these corridors? Is it, uh, is it something yeah. that they're just on their own? What if that vineyard goes feral because that farmer has lost hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last few years? There's not uh, Yeah, it'd be nice if they had a that. preservation grant like they do with the historic preservation if they had one for lands or for upkeep or for drive-by appeal or for you know um maintaining our our small town appeal sort of right so if we if i'm just you know i just i agree it's I agree. more of a comment than a, a solution I, I i'd like to i like solutions but i also uh i don't have an answer to that because at some point people run out of resources and uh you know like I said, you have the the blight ridden abandoned vineyard on you know they're they're all over on in the Big Valley, um, and I think from what I'm hearing from the the great market, we're going to start seeing some more getting pushed out uh, mm -hmm. soon. So I think it's important to to have the foresight to know that uh, these things aren't maintained um, by and large. The, the parks and stuff, of course, they are uh, maintained by the county, but uh, these are private, you know, individuals by and large taking care of these corridors. So I just think it I wonder, like that. that would be cool. I wonder if there's any way to incentivize guys like Brian's talking about, the guy who is out there mowing and making the place look so you know beautiful to drive by and, and good entry into the area and all of that. If they could be incentivized for doing that and maintaining that, um, you know, um, Maybe that's grants. I don't know, but I agree. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I, was, I don't. I, again, it wasn't a. It was a. It was a problem, not a solution. I presented. Oh, <laughs> I think I'm actually hearing a priority emerge here. So keep going. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, no, it's for good me, stuff. For me, I'm sorry. Well, not before for you, because it's not just. You're not the only one. You know. Well, go back to your go back to your question of uh, how do we keep our small town feel, and it all goes to open space and small town businesses and things like that. And and so here it is. Here's one of the answers: is let's let's protect our um, and incentivize for better drive by appeal and, and maintaining and and keeping up those areas that we're known for. I can, I can only imagine. Yeah. Uh, I can hear the, I could hear the yelling now if those, if those fruitless, uh, if those fruitless plums came out of, uh, the road there. The people, people stop and take photos and it's like, it's, it's really is beautiful. Yeah. Do you remember, do you remember the outcry at the end of 175 where it's going into Middletown? Where remember they had all those huge oak trees and the oh yeah ah oh, and they cut them yeah, down. Massive. Oh, it still hurts. Yeah, hundred year old oaks. Yeah, yeah, but now we yeah. can go seventy miles an hour there, so we're good. <laughs> yeah, <that's> good. <laughs> you know, you win things, faster. you lose things. Oh my god! <laughs> right. Okay. Oh, just kidding. 60, 65 miles an hour, Brian. I only got 65. <laughs> All right. How should the county, let's see, do a time check. 354. Typically, 
I don't let these meetings go over 90 minutes just to make sure that we stay focused and productive. Um, does anybody have to go at four or can we keep going? I, I got to jump off at four. I'm sorry. Okay. But, you know, think, keep, keep going. Okay. Well, then let's get in what we can get in. Keep going. How should the county amplify the area's indigenous history, support indigenous traditions, and collaborate with indigenous communities? The top winners of this survey on the multiple choice section was increase knowledge and promote awareness of about of living Native American culture in the region, the history of indigenous peoples in what is now Lake County, and how the county's relationship with local Native American tribes has evolved. And then the second one was establish and maintain collaborative relationships with local Native American tribal representatives to facilitate facilitate tribal consultation and preservation of tribal cultural resources. Does anybody have input on this one? I know this is a uh, sensitive topic for this LAPAC in particular. So I want to make sure we stay focused on the question. No, I like the, the options that folks gave. I think the, that covers mm -hmm. a lot of it. Well, I think if we um, take this a step further, this can help our tourism appeal by offering some cultural programming. It would take some development, uh, especially if we had something like a living history program. That is definitely a good way to engage visitors, whether they're county residents or from out of the region. I know Wyoming, ha it still may have a living history program where they uh, recruit students to wear the dress of the era. And at the time, it was in the 1860s or 1840s. Um, and then these students will model how life, daily life in Wyoming. So we, if we did something like that, that could appeal to visitors. Thanks. Do we, do we know if any of this is incorporated into the development on Soda Bay down there near Yellowhammer? The Starbucks, fuel pumps, market? Um, I don't know. Good question. Elizabeth Lincoln would be able to tell us, but she isn't on this meeting. She's another yeah. member of the LAPAC who's overseeing that project. Yeah. That's a... Thirty-two million. Actually, I don't want to guess at the numbers, but uh, obviously a big project. I'm wondering yeah. if if this is incorporated into that. We we don't have. Good question. I I you know it's I I lived here a little over four years, right? And I've always wondered, and so I've got the sense of the Native American presence here and and importance and all of that. Uh, I've always wondered why there aren't. Again. Lakeport or even Kelsey Bill, uh, you know, shops that sell like you see in Arizona and places like that, Native American crafts and, and tule baskets and all of these different things that because I would think tourists would come in and just go crazy with that stuff. We did used to have one in the artist college uh, co um, cottages over on Highway 20 in what was that Lucerne? I think, yeah, there was just a, a, a tribal there, arts though. store. Oh, those are big tourist centers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is just uh, rampant gossip at this point, but I have heard from a couple of different people that plans for the new tribal um, offices, admin offices, and peds over in the old bowling alley is mm -hmm. to include some native-owned retail. Um, oh, nice. Good. Cool. Good. Straight up, just what I've heard through the grapevine. So I don't know if that has any. That'd be awesome. You know, way behind it, yeah. You know, we have, for instance, the Thule Festival that goes on here. That is way under publicizing. You would think tourists would love to go to something like that, where they're making the Thule boats and doing all of that. And uh -huh. I've never been. So I That's don't know. If it's really that big of a deal, but it is pretty cool. It seems like it would be very. That's why I think 
I, I really do think, you know, I saw a couple of the comments, no amplification needed, and it's not the county's job. And I think that's a perfect example as to how the county can amplify in a way that does make sense, right? Like, which events are you pushing out and supporting financially and things like that? Mm. Okay, good. That could be uh, that could be also reflected in the economic development aspect of the general right. plan update, too, yep. is to be more collaborative in uh, what we are promoting. Cool. Anything else? How should the county mitigate illegal dumping and other nuisance issues? Million dollar fines. <laughs> God, I hate that. Really, really hard to prove. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know what? When they dump a car, I've always wondered this. When they dump a car, the the VIN number is right there, right? They're not filing. Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, but VIN numbers are all over a car. I mean, you can look on the side. You can look, you know, on Sometimes. the dashboard. You can look on the engine block. Golly, just look this guy up and I don't know. I hate so, uh, Lake, Lake County is unique for many, many reasons. And uh, when you have like <laughs> four releases of liability and your cousin's aunt uh, stole it from your. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's when who, who are you holding? Uh, we've had this talk with the DA's office. It does not go well. So I don't. You know what, Brian, do you also find our our abandoned vehicle abatement program finds that a large majority of the abandoned vehicles aren't even from Lake County? Like no, people come no. to Lake County to see our water, drink our wine, and leave their car here. Leave their car. Tremendous, <laughs> tremendous strain. That's, that's on, our new uh, tagline. Yeah, there you go. Right. Yeah. Lake we County, talk about take our wine and leave your car. <laughs> yeah, we, we live, eat, play, and take your car of, back uh, with you. We talk about trying to take care of our business owners, and our our tow industries would be sunk if they had to continually pay to pick up the motorhomes and rvs that seem to be dropped all over our highways and and county roads and yeah uh, up until the point that they are towed the the stuff that's coming out of them i'll, I'll spare you uh as far as hazardous waste uh you can imagine that's going oh. all, all over so um huh. i think basically maybe prioritizing funding to code enforcement to uh, allocate funds towards the people that are dealing with the issues which would be the tow companies were just basically smash and grab them um, because I've I've seen the follow up because uh, it is a crime to abandon a vehicle. Um, it's just something that California hasn't prioritized. I mean, hmm. call your local congressman or write them or whatever, but they're not going to prosecute somebody who, um, you know, their car was abandoned on the side of the road or RV. So I think uh, dealing with it rapidly, I think you can look to other counties. I think you can look to, well, you know, wealthier counties uh, where they probably have better funding for code enforcement and programs like that. Uh, I, I think we, I don't know, Mireya, you might have a better feel of this. We go through that funding pretty quick, don't we? Yes, we do. Yeah. Like in, like and we're pretty funds stingy on when first, we use it. Right. Uh, so, I don't know. I, I hate to say money oh, fixes it. We just lost it, power, so I got to go run oh. around for a second. Yeah, Mark. Mark. Hi, Mark. Um, I, I just feel like I, I hate to say throwing money at it would fix it, but it would it would it would it would help reimburse the tow companies that are actually hauling it away, crushing it, taking care of it the, the proper way. Well, we are really reimbursing like those towing companies. We have them under okay. contract, but it would enable us to do more. More. Yeah, it'd just be faster. It'd be, you know, it is an but eyesore and it's a terrible thing for us to to have that. Mm -hmm. that reputation uh, when you drive into Lake County and you see these abandoned, you know, cars and motorhomes, it's not a good look for us. Yeah. Sabrina. I to, yeah. I have to jump off. I, I just wanted to jump ahead on the question 19, the access to healthy food, throw this out real quick. Cause I, I didn't see it, but if I missed it, my apologies. Good. Um, and that is, a, I would really love for the um, County to do whatever it can to encourage districts to rethink um, food in schools. Okay. You know, Before you point, leave, before yeah. you leave, what I want us to do is keep going as far as we can on today's meeting. Then we're going to finish up second survey. And then after that, we need to go over the existing Kelseyville area plan at the policies that are currently in existence and see what we want to keep and see what we think is obsolete and need to get rid of. That's oh. your homework. Go over the All Kelseyville right. area plan. Thank you. Okay. See ya. Bye.
Okay. Anything else on illegal dumping, not just limited to vehicles? So let me tell you, the top answers that came out through all the different surveys was one, hold people accountable for the code, and two, um, f get some funding to support some of our lower income and our elderly populations to help them make sure they're in compliance. Yeah, also, maybe. some people have wanted universal dump, uh, universal trash. You know, I, I wonder if, uh, I don't know, it's another handout, but, you know, we, hand, we give out food stamps, could there be trash stamps so that people, instead of dumping bags of trash on the side of the road, feeling like they can't pay to take it to a, trans, you know, to a station? Um, Interesting. Uh, you know. That would be part of um, finding funding to help low-income and uh, like low-income residents comply. And then trash. you're always saying, are you just keeping them low-income by doing that? I don't know. I, are you? Will they make more money if you don't give them a trash stamp? Yeah, I don't know, but I you just wonder sometimes if if you're inhibiting uh, ambition by handing out everything. But I don't know. Thankfully, that is not on the LAPEX agenda to have to worry about. Yeah, true. I yeah. just want to know what you guys' priorities are. Well, well if we're, definitely if we're... The, the car thing is that's that like Brian said that's an issue and that you're probably ongoing and probably tougher. But the bags of trash. Um, if there's some way we can figure out, maybe, maybe people just need a hand up on taking trash to the transfer station, you know, provide I have not heard that one yet. That's a good one. Neighbors helping neighbors. If most of our residents are renters, then why don't we require the property owner to pay for the trash pickup? And then that owner can turn around and charge that as part of the rent. I don't think that most of our residents are renters. I thought I saw I a statistic that it, that they are. We have a huge uh, or a pretty big number of renters. Well, I, do. Um, I, I saw somewhere in the survey that there are a lot of people who are not that paying for trash pickup is optional. Why? It is why in unincorporated we, areas. Oh. Um, with maybe some exceptions on multifamily residential development. I think that that's required because you have to have dumpsters. Okay. But yeah, it um, historically, the board has talked about it over the last, uh, since I've been with the county um, uh, periodically, and they have been reluctant to require trash pickups because we have so many very far rural areas. Um, right. Right. And because of the financial burden. So, but it's been an ongoing issue, mm. um, especially with the the trash requirements and uh, waste diversion and recycling requirements that we have from the state too. So. Yeah. Anything else on that? If not, we're going to move on to healthy food the one that Sabrina started us off on. How should the county ensure access to healthy food? Um, but top answer was expand local food access and agriculture by supporting and encouraging farmers markets, urban farming, community gardening, food forests, and other similar activities. And then the other one was support opportunities to establish or expand programs to improve food security and eliminate hunger. So this would be food assistance and uh, nutrition programs. What do you guys think? You know, it was easier said than done. Um, you know, Bruno and I have had discussions on this and we were thinking, um, you know, right now you have a on a Saturday or a Friday night, maybe a Sunday somewhere. But if you could develop these distribution centers that farmers and, and ranchers, too, for meat, could take their products and have them there and Monday through Friday. And restaurants then who or caterers, for instance, if they needed something on that Monday, they could go and get it. And then, you know, also if they utilized locally used produce and meats 
Um, they get a sticker in their window that says we only source locally, you know, things like that rather than go to Cisco. Um, but um, the thing is, you don't, uh, you know, it's not like LA where a restaurant can go to wherever any time of the week and get fresh flowers and everything else. Um, so we had these distribution centers that were open Monday through Friday that farmers could take their stuff and not have to deal with spoilage. But and then people knew they were there. And you could go in. You could buy uh, local produce. And then of course the education in the schools. Cool. Like a local market. Right. And that's cool. Um, and as far as the land and putting up these kind of warehouse like areas, uh, he was thinking of using reclaimed land, you know, um, uh, that needs to be uh, taken back. I like that. What else? Weston? The, uh, um, like, you know, when we're, I guess when we talk about housing and, you know, future developments in housing, but to build that into that, you know, development plan that there's, you know, a, a you know, quarter acre, half acre, whatever, whatever that dimension is for that housing development to have as, you know, a community garden, um, something like that. So then, you know, the, you know, the, the people in that development have access to, you know, a place to be able to kind of grow their own stuff. Good. Also along those lines is to take advantage of infill. So when we have empty retail spaces that are vacant for a long time, or even residential, if you can consider um, agriculture, like hydroponics, something that can be done indoors, so we produce more food that is available to county residents. And that okay. could also be like a little market too, if it, especially if you can have several of those properties uh, close by. Super. Anything else? Well, also building on what Sabrina said about local food, healthy food and food in the schools, in general for land use, if we preserve our ag lands and the ag land de designations, that would help a lot. One of the write-ins was promote community-supported agriculture by subscription. Those those uh, produce boxes. Ah. What? what else? That could be a co-op between a number of a few farmers. Uh huh. And so, also look into new ag models for local food production. This is where your idea, Mark. And, and Weston, this is where that would go. Community supported ag subscriptions, vertical indoor uh, using vacant retail office. Um, if this we could add to that one for um, local produce hubs or local where something like that. Mm -hmm. Good. How should the county ensure access to quality health care? Now, let's just take a note or take a moment. This is question 20. I think we only have like eight left, so I won't keep you here forever. We are actually nearing the end. Oh, 29. Um, we'll see how we're, how far we can get in the next 17 minutes. Is that good? No, maybe 12 minutes so we can talk about next steps and um, probably another virtual meeting. Are we good? Hands up. Good. Sticking with me. Okay, good. How should the county ensure quality or ensure access to quality health care? Top answers were encourage and support the expansion of medical facilities, um, pharmacies, uh, and then lead and support multi-pronged effort to attract medical professionals to Lake County. One thing I would like to add here um, is, uh, is recognizing that this idea is also connected to broadband access, I think, because telemedicine has become such a valuable asset in our region and can only expand. And it takes care of the barriers that we've had to attract and retain um, local medical professionals. So that's all I got. What do you guys have? I think it's still dark over at Mark's office. Uh, 
that sucks. I think healthcare is. I, Go ahead. Uh, who was first? Go ahead. Like we need. Um, it's a you know a workforce issue, and um, you know to kind of develop our own um, healthcare workers. You know, which starts in starts potentially in high school. Um, and to be able to get them the opportunities to, you know, kind of start exploring healthcare in high school and then <clears throat> remove the obstacles for them um, to go into uh, um, college with it. But it's uh, vital. Okay. Well, so the county could come alongside and support schools uh, education outreach. Yay. Yep. Yep. Um, Maria, I just thought of something that um, since this is a 20 year plan, yeah. you know, Cecilia Aguilar Curry was over here at the farm and we had a, a, a meeting with uh, a number of people that Jillian set up. And I asked her about how hard is it to get a four year university into an area? Because if you and she went off on a tangent about how that has lifted so many communities like Merced, there is another one that uh, I think in Humboldt that went into Humboldt. And after three or four years, that community had been lifted because you got all these people coming to visit their kids. You've got now you're you're building uh, dorms and you're they're going out and shopping and using the small businesses. But a four year university, then you've got places where if they wanted to be uh, focus on agriculture, obviously great place. They wanted to focus on small business entrepreneurship, great place uh, to a certain extent. And, um, you know, uh, uh, fabrication or vocational, uh, things like um, that. Medical care. Medical, that was the other one. I was talking about medical care and, huh. um, it's, I just think you, if we started the ball rolling to get a, I don't think the UCs are expanding. And I know the Cal State is, um, they're having some financial problems, but I know that they, I've just read where they've, they're interested in expanding. But to get a four year university here would be a pretty cool, I mean, that just lifts up areas all the time if, you know, um, when they yeah. come in. That has been a priority in the past, and I think it's a really smart thing to retain that as a priority. Good. But it's, we're it's talking a, about ensure access to quality health care, so perhaps this ties into that. Is there anything else on quality health care access? Well, one of the suggestions that is already down um, is, you know, partner with medical schools like UC Davis and UCSF because they already have rural medicine programs. Maybe they, there's some tie-in there, especially when we're talking about perhaps some uh, county funding. So as um, Weston was saying, that we grow our own. Say we tap, um, you know, promising high school students and say, hey, uh, you've got a lot of talent and we'd like to see that talent blossom. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd like to see you to be, become a healthcare professional and, and come back to Lake County. Good. Hey, Mark, did Cecilia talk about um, what a lot of our two-year colleges are doing, which is expanding to become four years? Did she maybe, because maybe we could just expand what we have. She didn't say they were expanding to become four years, but um, uh, they are trying to do more grow your own and and experiential uh, learning so that and, and incentivizing people to stay here. Um, that that I think I think your idea and Margo's idea actually come together yeah. at some point. Yeah, let's keep our kids local. Let's increase our educational capacity, and then keep people here, which increases our access to healthcare. All of the this, future. all of this yeah. year stuff that you're talking about, all combines to keep people in the community or want to be in the community. Uh, because one of the biggest problems, if you can talk to. Uh, Tim Stevens at Sutter, you can talk to these guys uh, at Adventist and play. It's tough for them to, when they bring in a doctor, say it's a guy and mm -hmm. the wife doesn't like the area, they're not staying. 
they're going to go. Um, if after a year she's just not enjoying herself, then, you know, we got to figure out ways to, I don't know, find that sweet spot to keep them here. Yeah. I encounter that in our hiring for community development staff as well. It counts a lot. If these people are already local, I want to keep them local. Um, when we get applications from people from New York, it's like, thanks for applying, but how can I hire you? You know, for one thing, where are you going to live? <laughs> where are you going to get a house? And, uh, and do you really know California? But, but yeah, if we can raise them here, keep the ones that want to stay here, give them a way to live. Right. I love that idea. What else? Quality hey, health care. Anything else? Well, the other thing with health care that they say uh, we need more specialized health care here. Hmm. You know, if you know, I, you know, just what were some of the things they're talking? I mean, we can get if I can get my knee replaced and and get my heart checked and all that, but some of the more specialized. Healthcare, I've got to go to San Francisco or Sacramento or someplace like that. And maybe I should anyway, but who knows? All right, and next I'm question. Wondered, oh, I've always sorry, wondered ahead. why Adventist and uh, Sutter and Tribal Health don't create some sort of an advisory board or coalition where they could work together to lift all the boats, you know? Or is it too competitive? Uh, to do that. Well, Mark brings up a real good point. You know, we, we could build up Lake County as a healthcare hub, a region um, for all points north. So people don't have to go to San Francisco for, you know, that specialized care. Because there are a lot of rural counties north of us. You know, and if we had cooperation among the um, hospitals and the medical facilities, in at least in the county, that could become a reality. Interesting. What? Um, okay, next one. How should the county ensure that residents have access to vital communication uh, services? So, of course, you know, the one of the top answers is encourage and support efforts to expand and enhance broadband service. Um, another one, another second one, just as top, just as many people encourage and support efforts to improve cellular phone coverage and reliability, especially during extreme weather and hazard events. What input? Elizabeth, do you have any ideas? I haven't called on you yet. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, I know it's definitely a problem. I'm relatively new to the area, so, um, I'm kind of new to having, um, issues with my internet. I came from Sacramento and LA before that. And so it was just much less of an issue. We had more options. Uh -huh. So I don't know if that is something, if there's any way to encourage more options for, um, for people to look to. Yeah. Good point. What else? Anything on this one? Cer certainly a public Art safety uh, issue. Um, yes. I come upon dozens and dozens and dozens of people stranded in uh, broke down cars that are between our kind of no man land, no man's land areas, Highway 20 on your way out to mm -hmm. uh, the, the Caltrans provided uh, call boxes are unreliable, um, don't mm -hmm. work, there'll be people stuck out there for, it's, it really is uh, one of those things that it's frustrating about being being in Lake County. I understand our rural areas. It's a charm to being rural, but uh, I feel like we've uh, advanced enough as a society to where everybody's pretty dependent on these cell phones. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if there's a way to streamline that uh, administratively to okay. plug plug a few more of those throughout the community. But um, I certainly think in a time of disaster. Um, Nobody regrets having cell service or not getting throttled uh, down to where it's basically unusable. One that addresses that is streamline the permitting process for cell tower installations while ensuring quality design and mitigation of potential impacts. We have so many nooks and crannies, you know, in our county that that uh, we do need additional cell phone towers or we're not going to reach them. 
and undergrounding. And undergrounding. I don't know why it can't be done. Is it just a money thing? I don't know why. Uh... It's a money thing. And a planning and designing thing. Not planning, us planning. Planning, like, you know, thinking about it. Rolling it out. Oh. Yeah. yeah. It just seems like that would be. We we ask them, uh, after Valley Fire, we ask, hey, you know, all of your lines have burnt down. How about you reinstall with undergrounding and copper wire while you're at it? And they're like, nah, thanks. And they had all their power poles back up, like, what, in a week? I mean, it was that fast. They were crazy. It was crazy how fast. I mean, not a week, but but just that's how they were set up to roll out the response. Get those power poles back up. Get that connectivity back in. They weren't ready to say, oh, well, let's stop and take a moment and plan. Uh, it would take a long time. Let's figure out a plan to underground, which is what they're doing now, years later. But that was kind of frustrating. Yeah. Um, next question, unless, is there any more? Ensure, or wait, question 22, how should the county ensure that residents have access to vital community resources and services? So this is government services, civic services, access to emergency services, things like that. Top winning of well, the multiple choice was ensure that all neighborhoods have access to safe, well-maintained public facilities and utilities that meet community needs now and as the community grows. And at other top answers. Huh. Encourage and support the expansion of child care services to meet existing and future community needs. Change yeah. the building code. It's too strict. Improve stormwater infrastructure. I think that's actually one of the next questions. Anything to improve access to community services. One of the things that's come up in discussion in other areas is um, make sure, ma making sure we're establishing community centers where people can access services, particularly in like um, uh, power outages, uh, extreme heat events, things like that. You mean, you mean like... Uh Places to stay? Um, places where the community can congregate or access services. Okay. Not necessarily emergency shelters. But, um, but with, yeah. uh, can't, could schools do double, double duty in s situations like that? Or um, do you have your senior centers? Um, what other big halls? I know the schools are a good resource during evacuation issues, but I don't know that they're they're not really. Um, the county is focusing more on setting up uh, community resilience centers. If you don't, if you if it's 108 degrees out and you don't have AC, you can go someplace and cool off if you've got issues with you. Right. Yes, okay. they could. They could serve as um, service areas for during extreme weather events, um, power outages, but also in times of non-emergency, they could serve as um, community gathering centers. So just like, you know, multi-purpose rooms, community centers. So that's why some of our senior centers are um, sort of pivoting to, to um, merge into that kind of a use. Yeah. What else? I feel like this question's a little vague, kind of. It's hard to sort of wrap your head around it. And, uh, like, it's hard for me to sort of picture concrete stuff. Well, it's just, you know, you when you when you think about building something for that purpose, how often would it be used during the year? You know, what's your return on investment on, uh, I mean, is it only going to be used occasionally when people get too hot or too cold or... Um, and then, of course, the evacuations, that's a whole different game. Now you've got, yeah, you're opening your schools and you're, you're putting people uh, in these places. Um, it does take some planning. Yeah. Well, then again, you know, you have a place like that. It could be used for other things, too. You know, gatherings um, of other right. types of. 
But you also want to make sure that those uses are compatible because sometimes like if you're normally a senior center, you're really not designed to become an evacuation center for families or for people to stay there long term. So it does take uh, it does take a little bit of planning so that you can accommodate and pivot quickly to the get to the different community needs. I don't know that long term is you mean that's a long term meaning. No, I mean, like like the whole day. Oh, like if yeah, that, yeah. or overnight so, stays, so, you know, when PSPS is in or Seattle, smoke events for the uh, fire victims at, on the Boyles fire. We, you know, we raised about a hundred grand and went out last week and were handing out checks and stuff like that. But that was just for work in their house. NCO, those guys were handing out checks for hotels and stuff like that. So a lot of people were going to hotels. Um, and uh, so there are programs out there to help people in those areas. It's funny, a lot of people, you know, we've got money that we want to give them, we can't find them. So, yeah. All uh, right, we've hit 4.30. We have about six questions left, but I don't want us to drag ourselves through. So um, let's just pick up on question 23 about how the county can support local and small businesses at our next virtual meeting, which I don't know when that is. Uh, do we have one, Ruby? Yeah, I think it was uh, next Thursday. Next Thursday. Okie dokie. We're going to try to get that press release out. Um, Ruby's working on confirming all the stuff. I might not be able to get to it or get it email blasted out until this weekend. Uh, and then we can do county press release media contacts and stuff on Monday. Um, but part of my email blast then will be specifically to all APAC members and GPAC members. Uh, so we should have the, the next set of meeting dates, potential dates. But again, just remember that aside from the one in-person meeting, um, we're only going to meet as many times as we need to. I won't drag it out. Once we get through our five bullet points on our agenda for our deliverables that our core team needs when we start working on updating the draft, then you're done. And I'll leave you alone for the holidays and I'll circle back with you guys then in January once the draft Lake local area plan comes out to see if there's anything that we missed or got wrong. Okay. All right. That's Thank all you. I have for you today. Next meeting, we're going to finish this survey. And then uh, for the virtual meeting, we're going to go over the Kelseyville area plan that is current or our existing plan. So if you wouldn't mind sort of scanning, scrolling through the plan until you get to the things that are labeled as objectives or priorities or implementation programs, because we're going to go over just those the next time uh, to see what we want to keep or what we want to throw out or what do we want to change, add, blah, blah, you know, that kind of stuff. That's all I got for you today. I am on my way now to go support our local wine industry. Hope you guys have a good weekend. Oh, well. I'll do it responsibly, Brian. Before you guys leave. Go Dodgers! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>